the human nervous system, not quite the same thing as the, the nervousness that I'm feeling standing up here, but the complex system of nerves that's responsible for the movements, the feelings, and other functions like breathing that we experience every day. Without going too in depth, the nervous system consists of the brain, which is the control center and the processing center, the peripheral nerves, which send and receive information back to the brain. They communicate clearly and consistently with the spinal cord, which is basically a highway of communication between the two. So when we want to run, walk, dance, we tell our brain to send a signal through the spinal cord to the nerves, which tells our muscles to do so. When we feel pain, temperature, pressure, there's little receptors in our skin that receives that information and sends it back to the brain for processing. This is called the central nervous system. There's also the autonomic nervous system. This is doing things in the background of life that we don't even realize it's doing. It's helping us digest our food, sweat when we need to, and even control how fast we use our muscles or how far they can be stretched. All in all, these two systems, the CNS, or central nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system, and the ANS, work side by side with each other, running through the spinal cord, through very specific pathways or highways. But what happens when there's a pothole in the highway or a break in the pathway? Well, that's a spinal cord injury. My name's Matt Fuller, and I'm a physical therapist. And even after many years of training and schooling, I was in my last internship, and I got to work with a few people that had spinal cord injuries. I still didn't realize that there's more to a spinal cord injury than just losing the ability to walk. These people experience bathroom breaks that consist of catheter use or bowel programs that can take hours. They experience spasticity, which is when there's confusion between the brain and the muscles because there's a partial injury to the spinal cord, so that communication is kind of interrupted. Um, so when spasticity occurs, it's like a muscle holding or an uncontrolled muscle contraction, and this can make life very debilitating for people. Um, it can make lying flat to sleep difficult. It can make transferring in and, out of, in and out of your wheelchair, even dangerous. But in the end, I made it through my internship, realized all these things that people with spinal cord injuries have to deal with every day, and saw that there's an opportunity to help these people in so many more ways than just getting them stronger or learning to live in a wheelchair. Luckily, with today's technology, exoskeletons, we're able to give people relief from some of these everyday symptoms. I now work as a physical therapist and I specialize in the clinical application of using exoskeletons for people with spinal cord injuries. I get the distinct honor of traveling all over the country, helping people like Todd, who you'll so soon meet, be able to get up and walk and be active again. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be standing in front of everyone and uh, be here at the TED. It's uh, amazing. I've always watched TED Talks and uh, just the passion from each of the presenters today and all of the presenters that I've seen is really uh, amazing just to uh, learn about a little insight into their lives and uh, some of the things that they're passionate about. I'm here today to share uh, my passion with you all. Um, sports and being active was a huge part of my life. I was uh, always in whatever sport was in season, hockey, football, soccer, baseball, really what was ever in season I was playing. I just really loved running around with my friends, you know, being outside. Um, I was uh, in a car accident in 2009. I was paralyzed from the waist down, a compression fracture of the T9 vertebrae. 
uh, left me unable to walk. Uh, not only not being able to walk, uh, I wasn't able to run down to my basement, uh, hang out with my friends in, in their basement, just running in and out of the house as, as we do on a busy life. There's just so many things that go along with the spinal cord injury. Um, so here I am, a senior in high school. Uh, my life had been flipped, turned upside down. But unlike Will Smith, I didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't able to escape to Bel Air. Uh, I, did have, <laughs> I did have the Coldwater community, uh, Mercer County surrounding area, a lot of family, friends, a lot of people there to help support me in a difficult time. And it's something that really consumes your life in the beginning because you're so uncertain on exactly what's going to be happened, what's changed, uh, what is life now. You, I was ready to go to college and this happened and you know anything that happens in your life you you have to deal with it. It's, it's something that happened and here we are. So after my spinal cord injury I went to the Ohio State Medical Center. If you know the Ohio State Medical Center is very uh, up for spinal cord injuries and I, they were teaching me how to adapt to life in a wheelchair you know, how to, how to bathe myself, how to clothe myself, and just how to um, be out in public, driving around, attending college, uh, joining the workforce, you know, just learning how to uh, learn all the things that you learn growing up just from square one. Uh, so what I was able to do um, was once I, once I learned uh, how to do all those things, I was back to uh, my hometown in Coldwater, and just really trying to figure out, you know, what's this life about? How can I help other people since everyone was so supportive of, of me? So with my passion about the spinal cord injuries, being uh, paraplegic myself, I decided, you know, what type of technology is out there to help people uh, live a better life for themselves? We all know how it feels sitting down, uh, whether we're in the office in front of our computer screen or commuti commuting on a daily basis or just sitting in a, a theater for an entire afternoon. We know what it feels like to sit down. And once you've been sitting down and you're able to stand up and at intermission go out and have a nice stretch with everyone, that's not something that people in wheelchairs are really able to experience on a daily basis. That stretch and really just being able to stand tall and what the exoskeleton technology has done is given people the opportunity to get back on their feet. Uh, I graduated from Wright State. While down there, I learned uh, of another paraplegic uh, from near my hometown. Her name is Nan Davis. This picture is from uh, the 1980s. The computer-controlled electronic stimulation is the type of device that is fitted on her. She was in an accident that left her paralyzed on her graduation day in high school. And for graduation in college, she had this device and she was able to walk to get her diploma. And it's just amazing to be able to see this technology. 40 years ago, that's where we were. And with exoskeleton technology today, this is where we were. And in the heart of TED, we can all imagine what type of technology, if we invest in it, where can we be in another 40 years with this type of exoskeleton technology? I'm able to use this device uh, in my home, in the community, uh, through the park, the bike path, anything, anywhere just to be able to get out and walk around, uh, to stretch out and you know, just do something after work to you know, feel like I, I did something. I, I got up, I was active, I did something that day. Uh, it was, it's a really an amazing feeling. Uh, for the last two years that I've had this re uh, exoskeleton, I've walked 300 miles and it's just an amazing opportunity and I really want other people to uh, feel the health benefits of what it's like to, after six years for myself and much longer for others, to be able to stand and walk again. So Matt, how do, how do we get other people to uh, include those benefits? Thanks, Todd. That's a great story about how you're using the rewalk and exoskeletons to improve your life. Um, let's bring it back a little bit to where this technology has really become more accessible for people. In 2014, there were there was the rewalk, which Todd is wearing now, which was FDA approved for home and community use. Then in 2016, the XOGT exoskeleton was approved for clinical use in hospitals to help rehab people shortly after they were injured. And then recently in 2017, the Indigo exoskeleton, which is made by Parker Hannafin, was approved for home and community use as well. 
And the research and development hasn't really stopped there. The research and development has really gained traction these last couple of years. Um, there are 28 public research, publicized research articles that have been um, constantly and consistently benefiting, showing the benefits of this technology, the safety, and then also some of the physical benefits, such as decrease in pain, decrease in spasticity, improvements in bowel and bladder function, believe it or not, better sleep, and then overall better quality of life. And I know when you, you think about the exoskeleton, you see t Todd, Todd walking, it seems obvious. He gets to get up out of his chair, leave it behind and go for a walk, but it's more than just walking. We all know sedentary lifestyles, like Todd said, leads, leads to serious health outcomes, such as cardiovascular issues, numbness, like we even just have, like when you're sitting there, you just have numbness in your legs and bottom. And for myself and most of you, you're able to, and we're able to get up and walk around to relieve that pressure. But people who are wheelchair bound, sitting like that can even lead to horrific gaping holes in their skin. Bowel and bladder issues become more prominent. UTIs happen. Like I said before, bowel programs take two hours a day. So how are you supposed to live your day when you're spending two to three hours in the morning just going to the bathroom? So at this point in time, we, we have like, there's been 43 different health insurance companies that have covered these devices for people. That includes workers comp and private healthcare companies. Um, more importantly, the VA actually has a national policy that covers these devices for our paralyzed veterans. Um, but really, in, in my experience, we need stronger support from the health professionals that I work with. We need stronger adoption and want from the disabled community. We also need reimbursement options from health insurance companies. We need to stop fighting this battle that everyone seems to constantly be battling with health insurance companies to get these devices to people to make them better. It's, it's not experimental anymore. There's, like I said, there's 28 different research articles that have been published. There's people using them every day. We just need it to be known. And with mass adoption, there, it comes more funding and more opportunity for further development. And that leads it to more than just people with spinal cord injuries. There's people with suffering from stroke, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy. All the, anyone with disabled lower extremities can benefit from this technology. What I'm asking is that everyone just kind of keep it in mind and then as, as, as a cry from, from, from me to like my health professionals, just realize like exoskeletons are the future of the gold standard. Because in my experience with physical therapy, I'm sure people have seen you know, someone with a stroke or someone with spinal cord injuries using these long braces where they're sweating and struggling and they're taking three steps. Well, the research shows that it takes one hour of continuous walking three times a week to gain some of these amazing benefits that's Todd, that Todd's talked about and I've touched on. So why is something that takes 30 minutes to take three steps the gold standard. This is really, we, we need to change the standard. And so to d demonstrate kind of the rewalk uh, and to tell you more about the device itself, uh, what I have on my wrist is the remote control. And the remote control is um, communicating with the computer and the battery on the backpack. And with the, the sensor on my hip, it is working with me to be able to rock back and forth and pick up that movement. and pick up the, the motors in the hips and the knees and really just propel me forward as we're working together. So when I put it, put it into walking mode, we're able to see that everything working together is just a, a lot better than, you know, sitting in a wheelchair and figuring out, you know, how am I going to improve the technology to allow it to um, be accept, accessible to more people and get people back on their feet. This is something that is, is not new. Um, technology has growed, uh, grown over time. Uh, I was watching a video the other day. There was a technology um, in, back in 1989 called Backseat Driver. 
Uh, it was developed by MIT, and they said that in 1989, they had turn-by-turn -turn directions, and the patent lawyers for MIT said, you know, this isn't really gonna be something that insurance companies allow, so we're, you know, we're really not gonna pursue it. And I'm sure everyone has used GPS at some point, point. we all found our way to the library here today. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's amazing to see the, um, I don't wanna say small thinking, but pragmatic thinking and not, not looking forward and seeing where, you know, not, not just where we're at today and what is possible, what could be possible, and, and that forward thinking and that's something that we want uh, people uh, across the world to really understand that this technology, just like anything else, it's, it's coming. It's how, how quickly do we want it to arrive. And this, this exoskeleton has really changed my life. And being a paraplegic up here, I don't need, I don't need to stand here and tell you the importance of walking. Um, but that's really how simple the conversation and the struggle is with the insurance companies is they're, we're, we're trying to have an argument that walking is medically necessary, and they're, they're telling people in wheelchairs that it's not medically necessary. And it's, that's, that's, that's really the, the basis for where we are. So I just want everyone to know that the technology has come so far in 40 years, and it can go another 40 years and continue to grow if we just put the, the investment into it. It's not... The, technolo the people want the technology to succeed. It's not, it's not going to be the insurance companies that decide. It's going to be the people that decide what succeeds. Thank you.